this out of the way. I think we are live. Mitch, are we live? We're live! Oh my gosh, we're live again, DJ! You're ready to start the show, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't wait to chat with Kyle, and Kyle's in the chat room already. Hey, everybody! Holy crap, I don't see anybody in the chat room, so I must have messed that up. I'm good, DJ. You know I'm, I'm just better than you, that's all. In five, four, three, two... Hello and welcome back to another episode of DSLR Film New Podcast. I've got Mitch with me from Planet5D.com and we are up to no good early in the morning. It's actually <laughs> earlier for me than it is for Mitch, but Mitch, what are you up to, man? It's It's been a week or so since the last time we talked and you've probably had some adventures. Um, yes, uh, I'm, I'm having adventures constantly. Uh, I, after the show, by the way, I'm, I'm going to talk about something you've probably never, ever seen before. Let's see if I can hold this up. You may not be able to see it very well, but... Oh, it's a microphone stand to a quarter 20 adapter. Right? Um, well, actually, it's threaded for paint, um, paint sticks. So it's ah, got okay. a different thread to it. Than anything else you've ever seen before. Hmm. Uh, I got this for like twenty bucks one time. You you remember um, the guys at <laughs> Brain Dead Jag Thirty Five? Yes, I do remember the Jag Thirty Five uh, guys. They actually created this and put it up for sale for like a week, and then sold out and didn't want to make any more. So. Anyway, I'm, I've been shooting overhead shots, right? So what I'm doing is putting my 5D Mark IV on a monopod. And now that you can use your iPhone wirelessly to shoot, uh, I've been trying to get different angles. <laughs> so, so why the heck am I talking about this thing? This is why I'm talking about it. So what I'm doing is, like, this weekend I'm, I'm shooting my marching band friends again. And so what I'm going to do is do some some overhead shots since I didn't go out and buy the new quadcopters from GoPro and uh, DJI. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing the poor man's low version with overhead shots just to have a different angle because I mean, I've, sh I've been shooting this group now for two months and I'm getting really bored of shots from you know like field level of the marching band okay and I get five people in the front row and I never get shots of the people in the back uh, so I also went and bought a used edition of the 1.4 Canon extender nice so that I can have a little bit more range with my 70 to 200 uh, try to get those people that are in the back rows for stuff but that so I'm changing up a little bit this weekend and trying to shoot something different I've had the 1.4x and the 2x stolen from me on multiple oh, no. occasions. <laughs> I keep it in my bag, and it you know it's it's separate, right? And then uh, it's so small and easy. Somebody reaches in there and just I don't know if they're intentionally stealing it, but then they end up with an extra one because they have <laughs> one as well. It's a little frustrating, but yeah. What are you going to use to? I mean, I know you said a painter pole, but is there something strong enough in the painter pole category to support your DSLR that high up in the air? Uh, that's why I'm going to the hardware store. <laughs> Uh, I mean, a painter pole made of wood, granted, I'm looking for a longer one. I'm actually, I don't necessarily care if it bends a little. So I was sort of thinking of maybe one, if they're longer, that have PVC, kind of, yeah. you know, so that it actually curves a little, that would be okay. Um, to give me some angle to it as opposed to holding it straight up. Anyway. I don't know what I'm going to find when I go to the hardware store, but I remembered that I had this thing in the closet and I haven't used it for anything. So I was like, brilliant. Why don't I see what I can find in the hardware store? So that's what I'm doing for excitement right after the show. Hmm. You know, uh, one option you might want to consider, and I, I know this is a little more expensive than your $20 adapter, <laughs> but if you go over to eBay and you look for something like a carbon fiber boom pole, you can find some of those used for like 50 or 60 bucks. They are already set up for uh, quarter 20 at the end and three eighths, I believe. 
and that would give you a lot stronger and a lot lighter stick to hold up in the air. Uh, those are rated for like 15 pounds or so at the top. So as long as you're not using a huge, uh, you, you don't strap your 70 to 200 on your camera, of course, but you can right. put a, a wide angle on there and probably get right. away with it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm doing, wide angle stuff. On my end, guys, I've, uh, I've officially sold my GX8 and picked up a GX85. Uh, I've been playing around with that uh, lovely little camera. Got the goofy wood indie grip for it. And, uh, nice. of course, uh, taking this out and messing around with it and figuring out some audio solutions. Not particularly for this, but for the G85, which is the big brother to the GX8. And we'll talk about that in the show. Woohoo! Ready for the news, Mitch? Because I think nope. we've rambled on. Nope. Nope. What nope. else you got? Not ready for the news. I want to know who the hell Bob is and why, why you're wearing his clothing and was he killed in order to get those clothes? Oh, okay. For those of you listening instead of <laughs> watching, I'm, I'm wearing a shirt that says uh, Bob on it and it's B&M &B or M&B &B golf course. Uh, <laughs> the shirts, when I was younger and poor, I used to go to this place that bought up all the shirts that were left over at one of those like industrial cleaning places because they they take in business shirts and they wash them well when employees were fired they would have seven shirts of various sizes for employees <laughs> that were no longer there with uh, embroidered names on them and whatnot so i have a collection of those that are in my closet and this just happens to be the one i grabbed this morning normally you see me in my standard gray shirt which i have 20 of and that's actually the same type of shirt just without the uh, labels on it so sometimes I mess up and grab a colored shirt instead of the standard <laughs> gray attire that's that's the story behind this and I've got nice. Bob I've got Wilson I've got a, a bunch of other <laughs> names uh, stashed in there and uh, just random completely random so, so you're one of those stalker guys that likes to go up to neighborhoods and say hey I'm from the gas company and I, I'm here to fix your fix your vents actually in reality I have one of those uh, 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 reflective shirts, the yeah. ones that uh, you, you use for directing traffic. Uh -huh. And uh, I used to wear that to shows and concerts. And then I would hop out of the car, run over to where the directing area is, and then direct <laughs> other cars around so that I could get my vehicle <laughs> in and parked. And then take off my suit and get back in there and, and nice. get inside. It, it you a little well. scammer, you. <laughs> All right, on that note, it's probably time for the news. <laughs> time for the news. the news. First up on the list as I scroll forward is actually a new lens from Rokinon. This isn't quite new because we knew it was coming, but it's a 35mm f1.2 lens for APS-C cameras. Now if you're familiar with the APS-C crop, that means that 35 is roughly a 50 equivalent, and this is now the widest aperture manual focus lens available for that 50mm equivalent on an APS-C sensor. The lens will set you back about $499, and it is going to be available in Sony, Canon, Nikon, Panasonic, and even EOS M mounting Ooh, options. Mitch, that's nice. what do you think about this monstrosity of a lens? It's actually not that big, but I mean, this does offer up uh, f1.2. And that's before nice. that, what would you have? You have your 30 millimeter from uh, Sigma, the 30 millimeter f1.4, and you have the Canon 35 millimeter f1.4. The Sigma is slightly less expensive in autofocus. The Canon is a thousand dollars. Yeah. Would you go manual focus for that uh, F one two? No, hell no. I would never go manual focus. I, if I'm shooting video, of course. I. Well, even if I'm shooting video these days, <laughs> I, well, I'm using my five D Mark IV now, right, for video, which has the dual pixel autofocus. So, why would I do manual focus if I can just point and shoot now so you've been using that <laughs> autofocus system i've many times admitted i'm a lazy filmmaker and i no. often half press to focus and then walk off to shoot something uh, mitch did you ever manual focus in the past and did, what did you use if you did to sort of set your focus if you were just walking <laughs> behind the camera and then walking back again <laughs> Uh, I have been crucified many times. I'm laughing because I, I feel the pain uh, of... And, and it's really, really sad how um, crazy anal people are about focus, uh, especially on YouTube. Uh, cause 
I mean, for example, I know uh, Hugh Brownstone just posted something last week from, he went to the Sony event where they announced the A6500, and he did a, a an interview with the guy and set it on autofocus with the Sony A6300, and they weren't standing exactly where he had the focus point set, and then he turned around and walked, you know, and shot the video. And so the focus was off, and P comments left and right, hey, your focus is off, dude! God, can't you shoot anything right? Gosh, you're a filmmaker guy, can't you? And I'm like, give the guy a break. It's All you care about is you got two talking heads, right? But So I used to do my little stand-up videos you know, little reviews and stuff. I'd go outside and put my camera on a tripod and, and of course, try to focus on where I'm going to be because you're doing a one-man band thing. Uh, and before I had the T4i, it was, you know, very difficult to do as a one-person thing. Uh, then I got the T4i, which did a little bit of that, but it would still, it wasn't, it wasn't it the hunt. dual pixel auto focus. Yeah, so it would hunt, and if you moved forward a little bit, it would, it would do the hunting, and it that drove the commenters crazy. So I gave up on doing that. Uh, yeah, so I I'm frustrated. I'm laughing, but uh, you know people people do pay attention to that. And if you want to be respected in the industry, you've got to kind of do it right. And so yes, I've done manual focus stuff, but with dual pixel autofocus now, there's no way I'll go back to it. Ever. Why bother? It is uh, the the focus system on the 5D Mark IV is surprisingly phenomenal. It actually yeah. does a really good job of tracking. Uh, that said, I've always uh, been looked at as a weirdo because I <laughs> I use whatever cheats to focus. Uh, occasionally, I do have a set of manual glass, especially for my Micro Four Thirds cameras. I've got uh, a bunch of the Voigtlander series lenses, and I don't mind manually focusing if I'm going to be behind the camera and monitoring the focus on an actual monitor. But many times, you are not in that situation. You're kind of hurried, and you're doing more than one job at the same time. Uh, in those cases, you know, I trust the half press of the button. And if you'd have to do what Mitch was talking about, uh, consider your sh getting either an IR remote if you're a Canon shooter or uh, using the phone app uh, for most of the newer cameras because now you can set focus by simply tapping on your exactly. phone, which makes it so much easier. The IR trick is actually that you set the IR remote to picture mode, which is just a dip switch on the RC, I believe, one. Who are you calling a dip switch? <laughs> And that will give you a picture first, which automatically focuses the camera. Then you flip it to the other side and hit the button again, and that starts video recording. So as long as you're in the focus point, which you just mentioned Hugh had a problem with, uh, <laughs> yeah. then uh, you will be in pretty good shape for that. I don't know. I like the idea of this lens, and if it had come out probably six or seven years ago, I probably would have jumped on it. Uh, these days, I have so much glass that I try not to buy any more, if at all possible. It is beautiful. It is out, and you can find a link in the show notes. Next up, something you can't find, and this is really funny, actually. <laughs> uh, if you've been paying attention to the GoPro stock recently, it has been diving. And the reason for that is not because action cameras are going out of style, which I've been told over and over again is not the case. Instead, <laughs> it is because... GoPro is no longer available from GoPro on Amazon. What? Uh, recently, there's been some disputes between Amazon and GoPro over pricing and price listing on Amazon. Amazon's been listing the Hero 5 and Hero 5 Session for less than normally expected. You still can find the camera on Amazon, but as you'll notice right here, it says from these sellers, these are not GoPro themselves, but other third-party resellers as Amazon. well as Amazon. You said so, Go. they're not GoPro themselves. You meant Amazon themselves. Yeah, yeah, it's not sold by Amazon. It's third-party right. sellers, and right. GoPro is not able to sell them. So uh, it's kind of interesting, kind of weird that they're fighting, and this is hurting uh, Hero 5 sales significantly. M Mitch, what do you think about this? Is this time to buy GoPro stock so that uh, when it comes back... No, we'll, hell we'll no. Money? Oh, my God, no. What it's telling me is that... Uh, 
the leaders in charge of GoPro, and I don't use this word often, but they're stupid. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, okay, so you're having a fight with Amazon. Uh, you don't like the way they're pricing stuff, and I know, of course, Canon has done this too with their uh, MAP pricing, uh, but... <laughs> I mean, your stock's already having trouble. Your company is 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 struggling to sell cameras, and you go off and you cut off your biggest sales venue. Uh, that's not a smart move, and and it makes you wonder whether what the hell's going on. So would I buy the stock when it's a low price because they're being stupid? M maybe that's the right thing to do. But how did they recover from this? Well, right now, um, I believe October is one of the lowest uh, selling months in the year. So analysts are suspecting, they're, they're hoping that this will be back on Amazon at the 1st of November, which November through December are your right. biggest sell months. Yeah. If they can make that, and I, I, you know, obviously this is, this is definitely not a podcast that recommends stock picks. So <laughs> if you are here for those, uh, you've gone to the wrong place. But at the same time, if you think about the stock from Hero, if you buy it now while it's dropped down, I think 16 or 17 percent, and if the sales improve in November, yeah, if if they do, then what, what? What's to say Amazon doesn't go well? F you, pardon my French. Uh, GoPro, we don't want to sell your damn camera if you're not going to let us set our own pricing, and 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 so, you know, there's two. Two sides to every story here, and and I don't know. Amazon's probably not that crazy, but they could they could they could stomp their little feet. I mean, they've got a hell of a lot of weight in the pricing industry, and it's not going to change their stock price uh, at all for not selling GoPros. So directly from GoPro themselves. So who who cares? This also comes at a time where there's tons of other action cams yeah. available. And if you go on Amazon, guys, and you look around, there are even the 4K cameras that are around $100. Uh, that's a ridiculous price. They come with accessories, memory cards, everything. Video quality on those is going to be a little iffy compared to some of the higher-end models, but there are so many offerings all the way up the price scale that it, it's going to be hard for GoPro yes. to compete in general. And then doing shenanigans like this, you'd almost say, look, guys, I'm going to take that. Uh, I think Amazon wanted to mark it down to 475 and they were wanting it to be at 499 uh, so I mean, is that enough to fight over to lose that many sales? Uh, that's, no. that's ridiculous. What are they thinking? I don't know. <laughs> They're silly. Speaking of silly, a company well known for <laughs> its spinning drives has tried to jump back into the solid state market. Western Digital, we all know, some of us may love, some of us may hate, depending on your drive performance, has always been known for their spinning drives. They're trying to dip their toes back into the SSD market with a line of, I guess you could say lackluster. <laughs> <laughs> SSDs. There's nothing extremely special about these. They come in a range of 128 all the way up to one terabyte drives. They're priced uh, fairly reasonable, but $300 for a one terabyte drive. We can actually pick up one terabyte drives for around 200 bucks from previous generation models. Performance is in the middle of the line. So I don't know what Western Digital is thinking. Maybe hopefully they're going to uh, refresh this in a few months, years, and uh, continue to build forward. But Mitch, have you? did you ever move to an SSD? Because I know we've talked about this multiple times. Multiple times. Uh, technically, yes, my iMac that we are using right now is one of the uh, Apple quote-unquote fusion drives, which has the... Uh, Spinning drive and the uh, SSD attached to it? Correct. Uh, my MacBook Pro that my daughter is currently using up at college is one of the first uh, Apple laptops that was the SSD, and I loved the heck out of it. Uh, I'm currently using uh, 
uh, she had an old MacBook Pro from like 2011, I think, or 10. Um, and I, she came home from college this summer, and I tried to use it to do something, and I was, and it had uh, four gigs of memory in it, Ooh. and. and I know, I was like, how in the hell are you getting any work done on this thing? And she says, well, it's rather slow, but I don't want to ask you for a new one. <laughs> so, anyway, so I gave her the MacBook Pro, which, and, and this is a long story, I'm sorry. But I gave her the SSD one that I had purchased to travel to business work. Uh, but it was a 15-inch, so it's bigger and heavier than I thought she would want. I never offered it to her before. Uh, but it's dang, even even that has just 4 gigabytes of memory on it, because when I bought that in 2012, I think is the same time frame. Uh, even with 4 gigs of memory on it, because it has the SSD in it, it's pretty dang fast. Um, and anyway, I never wanted to crack open a MacBook... Uh, I thought it was a lot more difficult than it really is. So anyway, I've taken the old one that she had, and I happened to find some memory cards sitting around in my room that I didn't think I had anymore that were stuck in a box somewhere. And so I put 8 gigs of memory on that old laptop. And since I have it cracked open, I was thinking... You might know, as well I, put a drive in it. I might as well put an SSD in there. So I'm actually sort of in the market uh, to upgrade that thing. So this is an interesting little story. And I, it doesn't have to be lightning fast for me because it's an older, I mean, it's like seven-year-old uh, uh, MacBook, but it still works. Well, there's some cheaper ones on the market. If you look around, uh, SanDisk, which uh, incidentally Western Digital recently purchased and is probably rolling some of this tech into their SSDs, uh, these older drives, which for regular use are pretty awesome. They're MLC, or excuse me, they're SLC TLC memory. So the SLC is single layer, which writes fast as a buffer, and then the SLC, or excuse me, TLC, so many letters. Uh, <laughs> The TLC memory actually is uh, three level, three layers, so it writes a little bit slower, probably about 150 or 200 megs, uh, and the initial SLC cache is usually uh, 20 or 30 gigs. So for applications like yours, uh, this would speed you up and give you plenty of storage space. Uh, one terabyte is usually enough for most average yeah. users. Uh, if you want to edit off of a drive like this, uh, keep in mind that if you start uh, reading and writing to the drive at higher than the SLC buffer, you're going to get slower read and write speeds while it is clearing that buffer out. The slower, I mean, still probably three or four times the speed of a spinning drive, but yeah. slower for an SSD, not in the 500 meg a second range or what have you. Still, SSDs are freaking cheap. Use them, get them, buy them, stick them in your computer. Even if you have an old system, it will be night and day for you. Um, I'm actually working on a system right here that has, I think, three one terabyte SSDs in it now because they were on sale. Do I need nice. those? I don't know. Probably not, but I got them anyway. Moving on <laughs> to things I don't need. I did some experimenting this weekend. There's a video I just posted, I believe yesterday or the day before, of a headphone adapter option for the Panasonic G. 85 and GX85. Now it's a little bit redundant because the GX85 doesn't have a microphone input, so all you're monitoring are the internal mics, which is not very useful. The G85 does have a microphone input, and this is a little bit more useful. Basically, we are adapting an HDMI output to a headphone power amp and then into headphones. It's a pretty simple process, and any camera basically that is able to use the screen and put out HDMI at the same time can be jerry-rigged to work this way. It's not a new idea per se, but uh, about 15 bucks, and you can buy the adapter, put this all together, and now they sell them in the micro uh, micro HDMI category, which means you can plug them directly into your camera. Mitch, is this too jerry-rigged? I, I think it is, personally. <laughs> I did it for fun because somebody uh, uh, tweeted at me and told me, hey, does this work? And I was like, well, you know what? 
I have never really had a need for it, but sure, why not? I'll play around with it. Uh, would you do something like this? And if so, how would you manage all the freaking cables? <laughs> cables. Uh, I want everything to be wireless. I'm so sick of cables. Uh, but that's obviously not happening anytime soon. I think it's a great little solution if you're stuck in a situation where you can't monitor the audio. Uh, I have been burned multiple times by just making the assumption that my audio is working the way I wanted it to work. Recorded many, many, many videos over again because it wasn't working. So I, uh, my wife and I did something a couple of weeks ago for her business, and she thought I was crazy because <laughs> I was using actually the iPhone because it was the easiest thing to shoot the video with. Uh, and she thought I was crazy because I kept bringing my headphones to the process because I wanted to hear what was being recorded. Um, actually, speaking of that, by the way, uh, and I hadn't really thought about that, but what I was using is an NTG from Rode. So, okay. and, and you're wondering to yourself, well, how was he record monitoring the audio that he was recording uh, with the iPhone? So I was using the iPhone for the video. But what is at the end of this is Rhodes' new um, iXLR. Sorry, it's called, I have the box over here. It's called the iXLR. Okay. And again, I'm, it, this isn't a plug. They just sent me this, so I was testing it out. So now oh, it says iXLR on the back of the thing. But those of you who aren't watching video and listening to audio only, you don't see me holding this up. So it is a... Uh, XLR adapter, and on the end is the Thunderbolt plug, so you can plug it straight into the iPhone. That's why, hence the I on the iXLR. Ah. So it's an, X an XLR adapter for the iPhone. So that's how I was recording the audio. But there's also uh, a headphone, uh, jack. headphone jack so that you can rec monitor what you're getting off of the microphone as you're recording it. So... That's and and I I know that was totally not in the show notes, but <laughs> how did yes. you mount that to your phone? I mean, do you do you just hold on to it? Yeah, I was holding or? it. Okay. Yeah, I was I was hand holding it. My I had the iPhone up on a tripod. Okay. Because uh, I wanted a stable shot, and I didn't want to be uh, bouncing all over the place. And it was a small. We were actually in the bathroom, which is a whole other story, which I won't go into. Uh, but. Uh, I wanted something small. I didn't want a big old fancy ass camera and dealing with all the lenses and all that. So this worked out really well. I had good audio, uh, went straight into the iPhone with the XLR adapter and, and was recording great audio. Now, I got a question for you, Mitch. Did you yes. upgrade to the latest uh, iPhone? No. Because I, I wanted to ask someone who has it, and maybe one of you guys in the chat room has already purchased one. How does that uh, that new two uh, two lens depth of field system work? Because I've seen a few demos online where like they're able to actually get a little bit of bokeh, and it sort of reminded me of that um, that vaporware camera that you put money down for a while back. <laughs> yeah, I'm still waiting on that sucker. That's not due till next year. And I wonder if it's any good. So any of you guys listening, watching this later, you know, leave a comment on that. I, I would love to hear from you to, to find out if uh, the demos that I saw in the press releases weren't just uh, the best of the best. And if, if it actually does provide some shallow depth of field with that uh, double camera system. It does. I, I agree. I, it's a good question. Um, and... I don't know some of the reviews, and now I'm holding this as NTG a as a pointer. <laughs> uh, and and by the way, uh, eclectic guy in the chat room says I said Thunderbolt adapter. It's a lightning adapter that goes into the bottom of the phone. Obviously, there isn't a Thunderbolt thing. But anyway, thanks for that correction. Um, but I think, and again, I think somebody should correct me. Uh, but I don't think the portrait, the narrow depth of field works in video. I think it only works in stills. Yeah, that's correct. And so they say it works well, but I mean, you're not going to use it for shooting cinematic video. So 
it has its pluses and minuses. Now, speaking of smartphones, that, that was my transition right Ooh. there. Ooh, getting good here. Uh, actually, a company we know and love, or maybe we don't love <laughs> that much, but uh, Kodak has announced a brand new smartphone called the Ektra. Is that? Am I saying that correctly? Oh. It's E K T R A. I'm going to go with Ektra for now. Yeah. Uh, it's basically a leather bound point and shoot camera wrapped around a cell phone. We've seen an attempts like this from Panasonic in the past where they've combined a smartphone with a rather decent point and shoot camera. This one has a 21 megapixel sensor. It is rocking a rather interesting deca core processor, which is 10 cores total. Instead of just using the eight core system of big little, this uses big medium and small with the big processor being able to clock up to 2.5 gigahertz. This this thing is capable of both video and stills with an f2 aperture though the sensor is small enough that that doesn't really mean much mitch we just talked about the iphone 7 and its uh, fabulous uh, photography abilities what do you think about kodak's strange but classy looking offering i bought one what no you're, you think i'm kidding um I'm still waiting for my light 16 sensor camera to show up. I, this is, it's fascinating. I mean, you and I have both said, and I, I think you started it, saying, wouldn't it be smart if somebody built a camera that also had smartphone functionality in it? Um, so Kodak went in and listened to you, and they did what you said. Now, I'm really curious about this uh, minute. So you've looked at it briefly. Will you go back to the very first image in there in that batch? Absolutely. So is this big hunk of glass that's on the outside of this part of the lens or is it just decoration? I mean you see a reflection that that's obviously glass. I mean because it looks to me like you got a little itty bitty tiny lens but this big massive thing around it that is serving no purpose but the only thing i can think of is that that piece of glass that's curved is part of the lens uh so they have a gorilla glass protector over the surface of the lens itself uh, if you read into kodak's description uh, basically that gorilla glass covers the entire uh, okay. front of the element and then the elements tucked behind that the ribs that they put on these are actually some sort of light diffusion thing it was a pretty common move back in the day for older cameras the angles of dark material actually uh, keep it from gathering as much lens flare and I, huh. mean, I don't know how great that is but uh that's what they're doing. And you can also see <laughs> they've got a leather case for this. Uh, it is not a, uh, a zoom per se. I mean, you can zoom in and out a little bit with this, but uh, uh, the element doesn't move out of right. the front of the camera. Uh, leather case. The, the big integration here, and I thought that was a little weird, is that they're adding Kodak apps. And the Kodak apps basically allow you to send 21 megapixel prints out to the physical world and then have them mailed to you. Nice. Is, I, don't, I don't know what to say about that. Is, <laughs> do you have a, I mean, you're, you're a little bit older than me, so I'm assuming you Ooh. have picture albums. Yes. And photo albums and photo collections. And I used to keep the same thing when I was younger. Now I just dump everything onto the internet and <laughs> look through my pictures when Google says, here's what you did eight years ago. Congratulations. That's that's so much easier than digging through photo albums. Do you still collect physical photos, Mitch? Uh, no. Does I, anybody? I, I, I haven't printed anything... Other than, I mean, I have some 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 of my photos which you can't see on my walls here that I some of my favorite photos, and the last ones that I printed, which are over here to my left, uh, was a year ago, uh, because I wanted some art on my walls instead of just ugly green walls, and. My kids have not printed anything. Well, I take I take that back. 
uh, when Victoria went to college back in September, she printed off a bunch of stuff to have up on her wall. And they were photos that she'd shot with her phone uh, and her little point and shoot and some of my stuff. So, so yes, actually, kids, I, I, I forgot all about that. But, but that was, she doesn't have albums. It's not like she's handing out albums to anybody to go do. But the only other reference that I have is that I do know that, of course, the wedding industry and the portrait industry is still doing a lot of printing. Uh, especially for wall hangings and stuff. And I do know that that many photo books are, you can go to, there's a photo book a month deal, uh, like with, with Google. Okay. Um, there's, there's a service, and I, I, there's no way I could come up with the name of it. But uh, there's a service where it will go grab 10 or 20 or some number of, photos out of your photo stream and send you a printed little booklet so that you can have that and it's a monthly thing it's a, a subscription service huh so there's still demand for it um philip in the chat room just said i print photos for people a couple of times a week so yes people still print stuff dj it's it's I shocking print, i know i print large prints uh for wall right. hangs and for uh sale purposes but uh i don't print any any five you know five, uh, the little I don't print any little stuff and, and slide them into my my uh, you know keepsake books or anything of that nature. Uh, it's just the big prints and really those it's sort of a repeat because you have pictures that people like and they buy on a regular basis and so you just reprint right. the same thing over and over again. I, I wouldn't call that. I don't know. I, I I guess I am using printing, but. <laughs> your smartphone, uh, you know, are you going to take a picture with this Kodak camera and then send it off to have it printed and, and just marvel in the beauty of your 21 megapixel cell phone camera picture? I don't know. That sounds sounds a little iffy to me. The interesting though, the interesting thing though about this uh, camera slash phone is actually, and that's what caught me off guard. I had to look up this processor here. The processor in this guy is not seen in any of the other smartphones on the market and looks to be one of the the fastest ones uh, out there it's, it's still an arm processor the soc just uses the very latest technology that we haven't seen in any samsung or iphone uh phones yet i wonder i wonder why kodak is uh pairing this with such high-end technology uh when it's sort of a weird niche item is that justify the price and do you even know what the price is on this i wasn't able to find it anywhere i, I haven't seen a price no i was kind of looking for that um actually the verge the article that you posted has one at the bottom says 449 pounds this december in the uk and europe huh. it could also launch in the united states in early 2017 so that'd be probably 699 ish you know, yeah. it's what, 1.2 or 1.3? So regular cell phone pricing. Huh. Right. Interesting. Good job, Kodak. Way to stay on the radar with your 360-degree cameras in your smartphones. Uh, speaking of 360-degree cameras, let's take a look at this weird thing. Uh, this came up in, um, I, I'm uh, part of a small thread for the E1 Z cam. These segues owners. are amazing. Yeah, I'm just nailing it today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> This thing is a crazy 240-degree uh, lens, uh, reminiscent of that crazy Nikon lens that we used to see occasionally pop up on uh, eBay for three or four thousand dollars or more. Yeah, that and thing is cool. It comes basically, in its own big box. That's, yeah, that thing's it, awesome. It, it's wacky. It's weird. Uh, this is just about as wacky and weird. It almost covers an entire micro four thirds sensor. Comes in three or four different flavors. And I had to do a little bit of searching and finally found an English translation of this as you guys watch the webpage load. But uh, <laughs> this is a sort of crazy looking lens. Uh, super fish eye. I, I don't, what do you do with this, first of all? And the second of all, Mitch, uh, they mention the possibility of uh, taking this image and turning it into like a VR 360 degree shot would you do that and do you want this and 
what the heck are you going to use it for? <laughs> You're asking the wrong guy. Um, I think, I mean, there's, there's a place for fisheye. Most people, I, I don't know. I, I will say that um, I, I'm taking a Lightroom class. I think I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and the instructor is just really awesome. He's taught me some things that I never would have thought of. And yes, I, I, I could learn Lightroom all by myself, but having somebody who's an expert really go through and teach me some of the things that I never, ever would have figured out on my own is worth spending money on. One of the things he pointed out is that uh, inside Lightroom, and, and Aperture has it too, but I never really used it, uh, is the lens correction capabilities. Yep. And he showed us a fisheye, uh, several fisheye portraits that he had done that with the adaptation actually sort of maps into a flat rectangular image like we're used to as opposed to the fisheye effect. And he did one of a church inside a church uh, that was really awesome when it was converted to a normal rectangular image as opposed to the fisheye view. So maybe people do that. I don't know. I'm 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 reaching. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with with some answers to your question. Uh, I I it, I don't particularly enjoy the fisheye effect for photos and unless you're going to print it and trim it and make a unique round frame. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm struggling, DJ. Yeah, no problem. I'll take over from here. <laughs> uh, this uh, this particular style, I do enjoy it for um, those interesting shots, especially if there's performing arts. Uh, if you have a circus, for example, or uh, aerial strings, I, I had to do a shoot for for a bunch of, and I don't know if you're familiar with those. It's like sort of gymnastics on these right. ropes that you spin right. around on. And I, I do have some great shots in my collection of people hanging from those ropes reaching out towards the camera and with that sort of circular look you get these yeah. beautiful large hands and like tiny uh, uh ladies behind them because of the, of the distortion that happens and as you said you can stretch those out and, and do some pretty cool stuff with it it's very stylized very specific and almost falls into the same category as the tilt shift lenses where it, it's like yes i would love to have one of those but what the heck am I going to do with it other than sit outside and make people look like micro machines for an hour and then get bored <laughs> with it and move on to something else? Well, I mean, it does give you the option. You remember when I, we started this podcast, I was talking about uh, having different ways of looking at things, you know, the aerial aspect or, or whatever. And it certainly gives you the creativity to explore new stuff. But the fact that it is so wide, I mean, for example, shooting a marching band, um, unless you're actually in the band and, and maybe you're laying on the ground and you got 20 people, you know, Looking overarching, over the top of you. yeah, that kind of stuff. Maybe that would make it an interesting fisheye view. Um, I don't know. I mean, if somebody were to send me this, I certainly would love to try it out. So expected pricing on this guys is going to be somewhere in the $3,999 range. So, uh, if you want one. There you go. And I believe that's the correct uh, conversion. I was trying to do the uh, 3, 000, or 388,000 JPYs to <laughs> American. So that number may be different depending. Moving on to something else that's different. This is a camera, and we've talked about printing film, that I started with as a kid. This is the Pentax K1000. Uh, this little guy is an adorable camera it was a workhorse back in the 80s and early 90s and a tough little son of a gun and <laughs> basically it was a go-to camera for a lot of people uh it's not really something extremely important for new products but it's really cool to watch this torn apart on this petapixel article here so if you want to check that out they basically rip the entire camera apart and you can see all the inner workings, all the little mechanical bits and how complex this camera was to achieve the mechanism structure that it uses. Lots of gears, lots of clockwork, lots of tiny, tiny screws. Uh, 
it's really sweet, actually. I was pleasantly surprised. I've never actually torn any of those old cameras apart because I liked them. <laughs> Didn't want to break them. <laughs> <laughs> the Pentax K1000 is a classic. Uh, Mitch, you have anything to add to that? Because uh, I just liked it. I, I put it in there for no reason other than I thought it was beautiful to look at. I got no clue. I didn't even watch the video. I'm shamed that I didn't even make time to watch the video. Teardowns are cool, though. I, I do agree with you. I enjoy seeing what makes things go. Uh, and I, I used to sort of do that, but I was not any good at keeping track of where parts went. <laughs> you know, back in the old days, uh, I mean, now you could sort of videotape it and, and videotape uh, shoot a video and, and maybe be able to put things back together because you see how you took it apart. But <laughs> back when I tried it when I was a kid, I would, I would end up trashing everything because I never knew where things went back together. If we had to take something complicated apart when I was younger, we used a Polaroid camera and placed the parts uh, in a section and drew on the Polaroid so you knew exactly where <laughs> everything went. Uh, Smart. The interesting thing is, and I didn't know this until I started looking, but you can still buy on Amazon a Pentax K1000 with a 50 millimeter f2 lens for uh, 100 bucks. So nice. if you want this classic hipster camera and you want to start shooting your 35 millimeter rolls again, uh, that, that would definitely be a way to go. Can uh, you still get film printed these days? Oh yeah, you can still get film printed. Um, I, locally, there's, I think in my area in Portland, there are three shops that still do it. Uh, there might be more, but those are the ones I'm aware of. Uh, but I, I want to say that those guys don't do it in the shop. They still send it out somewhere else to have it batch processed and it comes back in again. Uh, you, there's tons of places you can mail stuff in. The problem is, is finding good film stock uh, these days. Uh, Kodachrome went away, what, a couple of years ago. And yeah. uh, so if you have a collection of that in the freezer, you're probably still okay. Black and white film's easy to come by, but good color stock is, is much, much harder to find. So, Well, I think I th your audio has gone to pot, by the way. Oh. Um, I think that even if you can, if you still have Kodachrome locked away, I don't think there's anybody that develops it anymore. I seem to recall... Uh, National Geographic gave some famous photographer the quote-unquote last roll of new Kodachrome. Really? Because, because the, the processing, there was one place that was still doing processing on Kodachrome. And maybe I've got, maybe it was another, another particular brand of Kodak film, but it's a, it was a fascinating, and I was really disappointed in the photos that he took because I didn't think they were all that interesting. But you know, there's a lot of I mean, there, there's a lot of pressure. If somebody says, "Hey, here's the last roll of of X Y Z film ever going to be made, and and you're the last one to be able to do any processing on it, unless it's done by hand by and but I don't think you can even do a Kodachrome by hand. Anyway, uh, fascinating video if you can find that. I don't have it in front of me, uh, but. I'm looking to see uh, online right now if I could find anywhere that processes it, and most of them, uh, most of the posts that come up are uh, people looking for places, you know, in message huh. boards. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I've done black and white development in house and color development, but it's color is such a complicated process that my color stills never came out very well. <laughs> you, know, you have to monitor temperatures and do a bunch of other stuff. I'm sure there's automated processes that do it much more well, yeah. precise, but uh, yeah. uh, uh, trying to develop myself, I gave up on developing color film after the first yep. five or six tries because I suck at it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to be honest, other than the, the the weird sort of texture feel of working in a dark room, I don't I don't miss the smell of photo bath or having to worry about all the other little bits and pieces and dripping that crap all over everything and leaving those little white sticky patches. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> it's nasty. A lot of those chemicals too. I'm sure they're not good for you. Uh, no. Developing film though, if you ever if you ever have a community uh, dark room somewhere, give it a try once if you've never done it because it is cool to try and understand the process, and then you can go back to the modern day and never have to worry about it again. Oh. I know I, I don't want to turn this into a political podcast, okay? Uh oh. But 
Did you watch the second presidential debate at all? Yeah. Yeah, I watched uh, probably like uh, 35 or 40 minutes before I was disgusted and had to turn it off. <laughs> so you didn't get to the end. So the audience, and this was here in St. Louis, by the way, uh, although I didn't go over there because there was no need because they had the whole place blocked off. Uh, but at the end, so that was the town hall debate. And so yeah. they had 30 people on stage that were going to ask questions. And if you watched the after bits where they still had the cameras running and everybody was shaking hands and doing all that kind of stuff, every one of the 30 people that were on stage apparently were given those little cardboard point-and-shoot... Like the disposable cameras? Yeah, they were disposable because... My, and I made the assumption that they were not allowed to bring their cell phones on stage for security reasons, and they didn't want them being distracted or anything else. But they were smart enough to know that these people were going to want their photo taken with the two candidates. Yeah. So they gave everybody those little green, and I assume they were Fuji because of the green color. But I, I thought it was fascinating that somebody thought enough ahead to be able to give them those disposable cameras so they could at least get some photos. And I thought that was pretty cool. You know, what's scary about that, if that's the case, Mitch, is um, you can turn those into tasers and bombs with very little effort. <laughs> uh, but they were, I'm sure that the, they were not taking them home or bringing them in, uh, you know. But they I mean, were, they were. The taser yeah. portion, you could literally just rip some pieces off of it and electrocute <laughs> a presidential candidate. That's, nice. I mean, you'd have to have a very uh, engineer. Uh, <laughs> you'd have to have a very ambitious person yeah. to accomplish that. Uh, that's that's <laughs> kind of interesting. Uh, I still see people, and not even older people, I see younger people with those out in the wild on more than I would expect of a regular basis. It's like, what? What are you? What you're taking a disposable camera out? Why wouldn't you just use your cell phone? Yeah. And I asked the last person I saw with one of those. I asked him about it, and they're like, "Oh, well, because I get these developed." And you know, I said, "I don't know anybody that gets stuff developed," but actually, that's the case. They they were like, "Well, yeah, I get them developed." And apparently, if you take them to a Walmart or Walgreens, they only charge you for the pictures that turn out. Right. So these guys will just uh, use a disposable camera take a bunch of pictures and if they get two or three gems they pay for those and they pay whatever the price of the disposable camera was and uh, that's it and then they have yep. three or four stills that they really like i didn't know you could do that because i developed so little stuff at walmart or walgreens <laughs> to, to to know that's but, true I, I i do know that walgreens will you know if you stand there and look at them they will only charge you for the ones that you like huh uh, which is fascinating um, it must be that cheap to develop uh, oh, yeah. the photos that it, it doesn't really matter. They're a disposable item. Yep. Hmm. Very, well, very interesting stuff. On that note, guys, I think we're petering out here. Whoa, we're... no, 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 no. We're not petering oh, out. Oh, nope. I didn't be... put it in the show notes. Uh-oh. Um, my friend, I, I, I'm doing a plug, okay? Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a plug. Uh, my very good friend, Barry Anderson, whom you know. I think you know Barry. Haven't you met Barry? Uh, I think so, yes. He is doing a tour of the United States teaching practical lighting for filmmakers. He's the uh, uh, wild-haired guy, right? Yes. Yes, okay, yes. 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 Uh, and we just posted a story on that last week, and he will be in New York and Philadelphia. Uh, I actually, <clears throat> I think he was in Philadelphia today. Uh, but that started, if you go to... Um, uh, I didn't create a link for it. Uh, but if you go to plan5d.com and look uh, in the recent stories, there's an article on practical filmmaking. Or if you go to practicalfilmmakers.com, you can see all the cities that Barry is going to uh, starting last week. Uh, so he's got 15 more cities to go visit uh, in the next two months. Uh, Barry is awesome. It's a two-day thing, so... The first day is sort of some classroom stuff, but the second day is all hands-on. Uh, and, and Barry is an absolute master at lighting. Uh, I know I, Barry, Barry is one of the most fascinating guys I've ever met. He's a good friend. Uh, 
he pestered me to meet me one day at NAB. I don't know if I ever told you that story, but I kept getting texts from some guy at NAB that he really wanted to meet me. This was like five, six years ago. And, I, you know, sometimes it's like a real pain because these, these stalkers want to come meet you and you're like, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so I, 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 I told him like 15 minutes before I was heading to the airport so that I could, you know, have an excuse to get out of the whole thing. <laughs> uh, and so I started talking to him and it was, and just absolutely became great friends. And it turned out he was going to the airport at the same time, so my excuse was totally blown. Uh, but we ended up going and having lunch, and we've been best friends forever. But if you're if you're interested in learning anything in a hands-on two-day seminar, you can take the first day or the second day or both. Uh, really decent pricing on this. It's not like thousands and thousands of dollars. I think the two days is, and I don't quote me on this, but it's like 350 bucks. And... Uh, uh, if you want, I can get you a 25% discount. Um, send me an email at planetmitchatme.com because I don't have a quick way of giving that link to you. Uh, but uh, check it out. Practicalfilmmakers.com is his is his tour, and that's going on now through early December, I think. It seems like the uh, new big thing. I've seen a lot of uh, filmmakers moving to doing these uh, demos and tutorials. Uh, even uh, there's a there was a writing uh, demo, and it was um, some actor that like I think it was was it maybe Kevin Spacey was doing some sort of like yes. writing clinic. Uh, yeah, I, I got a bunch of emails for it, and uh, it just caught me off guard. Like I, I don't really think of Kevin Spacey is a writer i mean <laughs> I, not to say that he's not it's just kind of was sort of strange and um a lot of these are actually really good if you guys have never uh messed around with lighting or or had access to really good lights uh stuff like this gives you the option to to see how it's done to see how it's used and see it in full fling and plus you get to play with the stuff which is uh the best part in the world on that note Guys, I'm going to mess around with this GX85 for the rest of the day and probably take an evening, morning, afternoon nap in that order. Uh, <laughs> thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Mitch, where can people find you? I am Planet Mitch on every social media crazy website, including um, MySpace.com. <laughs> You remember that place? That's still a thing. <laughs> uh, think, yeah, it's uh, still a thing. Doesn't uh, Justin Bieber own that? I, <laughs> I don't know if he does. That's pretty funny. Uh, obviously, I'm on Planet5D.com and PlanetMitch.com if you want to go see some really strange stuff that I'm doing with photography. Uh, and just Planet Mitch, everything. And, of course, guys, you can find this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and anywhere podcasts are distributed. You can find me, me at DSLRFilmNoob.com or on YouTube at the One Lone Dork channel, which uh, is bad branding by my part for <laughs> many, many years. Thanks for Why listening. Why won't they let anybody change their brand? I don't understand that. I don't know. I own both channels, but uh, I, I own know. DSLR Film Noob and I own One Lone Dork, but th I've used the One Lone Dork channel right. for as long as I can remember, and uh, you're stuck You're stuck with what you decide on. And I'm, it, I'm still mad at YouTube because you can't upload a, a new version. You know, if you, if you find a mistake or something, on Vimeo and, and other tools, you can go upload a, a replacement, but on YouTube, you can't. It pisses me off, YouTube. Yeah, there are some cases. Um, I, I did a monitor review like f eight years ago, and at the time, the monitor was on discount for like $28. And for whatever reason, uh, as soon as the video became popular and got up to three or 400,000 views, uh, the reseller of the monitor marked it up to $144. <laughs> Holy cow! And so uh, I've always wanted to add an update to that to say, listen, guys, don't pay more than $28. Get the hell out of here and go buy a regular monitor. <laughs> and people in the comments for years have, have been complaining like, you're a liar. I hate you. This monitor is $100. <laughs> and it's like, well, it is now, but don't – and this is eight years ago. So the monitor yep. back then, it was a good deal, but it was like a standard definition monitor with you know RCA inputs and nothing – Nothing fancy, no HDMI, no nothing, and it was, it was a good combination with something like the T2i from way back in the day. But 
holy crap, I can't do anything about it other than take it down. And I'm not going to do that because uh, it, it does good. But uh, it, yep. at the same time, uh, there's no way to tell people other than in the in the little written section. You that update nobody the reads. section, no one reads it. It's yeah. like, you know, I put little notes in there like, hey, watch out for this. You know, make, make sure you check this on your camera before you buy this thing to make sure it works for you. You know, and like people are like, I hate you. <laughs> so what do I do? On that uh, note, yeah. I'm going to end the show. I, I, Mitch derailed my rant towards the end, and we'll see you next time on another episode of DSLR Film Noob Podcast. Ranting. (laughs) And that's it for the audio listeners. Bye! Yeah. There's several... uh, problems like that uh, a video where i was like here's a audio solution for all your cameras well it worked up until like the t4i or t3i and then canon changed something and it stopped working nice <laughs> and the video is still sitting out there so people they click on it they watch it and they're like oh i'll buy this for my new camera but that camera didn't exist when the video was made and it doesn't work for that camera and they're very upset at me about that it's it's very frustrating it very... is youtube youtube's just frustrating like crazy so Oh, well. um, you know, the commenters, hmm, I love them. <laughs> you know, Actually, I, they're pretty tame in the camera department. They're, yeah, they get, I know. They get I really know. rough if you're, you're in a, a different group comedy, for example. They really just troll the heck out of those people. Uh, oh, man. It is rough. They, hey, Philip, thanks for listening. He says, I listen to every episode usually on my iPhone. So thanks for tuning in, Philip. Sully, next time show up on time, would you, bud? <laughs> I'm teasing. Sorry. He was late. He said he was late. This is early in the morning. Uh, it, yeah. The the news this week, though, was pretty slim pickings. It's, there's nothing going on really exciting right now. I'm wondering, uh, you know, I was expecting a Sony announcement this week. Um, I got an email from whoever saying that uh, Sony was going to announce a video camera that was full frame at uh, some point in the next two or three days. And then I got another email from him saying that, that that may not happen for a couple weeks now. And so what else? You know, we passed the biggest uh, news event, uh-huh. Photokina, and we're, we're rolling into nothing for the next season except for price drops. De- November, guys, there's going to be a lot of sales. So buy yeah. all your cameras then. On that note, I think, Mitch, unless you got something else, we'll wrap up the uh, video portion of the show. No, I'm good. All right. Could, you know, I could always rant about something. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We'll see you next time. <laughs>